that is hard because we are not disciplined. We will do useless activities because we are expected to do useless activities. Social gatherings, reading of papers you do not need to read, which you have no interest in even. You waste a lot of time reading glasses, you know, where names change, keep on changing, the, you know, the events remain the same. But so middle class, particularly the middle class people have more of this problem. You know, because it's expected to keep up with this and keep up with that is expected, you know, of middle class person. Our civil services are based on that notion. You know, person appearing for a civil service exam is expected to know about some prime minister's name in some remote part of Africa, as if that is going to help him in the gram panchayat where he becomes deputy collector eventually. And by the time he passes the exam, the prime minister has changed and the country is different name. But this is what we inherited from British, that sort of concept. And it has been, you know, there is a proverb, and lots of things are like that in our educational system, which are obsolete, useless, and absolutely terrible. But they are there simply. Somebody asked me, why are they there? So my answer was, there is a proverb, Piche se chali aati hai. You heard that proverb? Piche se chali aati hai. You know how the proverb came into being? You know, Muslims, they were doing namaz. And during the namaz, there was a new guy, the first time for doing his namaz. So he was bending and his hand slipped and hit the guy in front. So that guy was also new. He thought this was a part of the process. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he hit the guy in the front. You know, so all the way it went up to the front, you know, fr first row. And then the uh, uh, that there was this guy who is the head of the, the head priest sitting there. You know, and this man hit him. He said, what are you doing? He said, I don't know. Peaches are chali out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, for all the way from the back, it's been... You know, so that's why lots of things we got in our education system, pieces are chali out there. We never give it a thought. If any reforms are made, they are facelifting face lifting job and not the, you know, basic changes. All right. So, Cooperation, to do cooperate with yourself. Environment, environment. It should be where you do this relaxation or self hypnosis, the place should be relatively quiet. But if you live near Santa Cruz airport, you know, that, tell me, let me tell you this, it's all right because your mind gets accustomed to that also. As a matter of fact, I have a friend in Montreal who has a clinic right near the airport. And he's on, the airport came later, so he couldn't move and there was a lease on it. So now whenever he works with his patient, he says, every time you hear a jet fly by, you will go deeper and deeper into this. <laughs> 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 it's a part of the procedure, you know. <coughs> Human mind can adapt to just about everything. I have to believe me, it's the funniest thing. So if, but if you can find a quieter place. Another thing, tell all the people, when you're doing this relaxation, huh? Tell, if you are doing it at home, inform the people in the household what you are doing for 20 minutes or they leave you alone. Otherwise, what could happen? You are lying there with your eyes closed, looking absolutely motionless, you know, and your little five-year-old kid walks in, you know. Mommy, mommy, daddy looks dead! You, know? <laughs> you wake up frightened, you know. She comes running out and you are wide awake. What happened? She's not concerned about you being dead. You scared the kid. <laughs> So please tell them. <laughs> or if you are a doctor practicing hypnotherapy on patients, please tell the nurses and the secretaries and the receptionists also something about it and what to say and what not to say to the patient. Otherwise, you to convince your patient and condition the patient that you're going to do hypnosis, which is going to do wonders. And the person walks in, the patient next day walks in, you know, excited about this new hypnosis that you're going to do on him or her. And says, tells the secretary, oh, doctor is going to do hypnosis. And my problem is, she says, huh? hypnosis? Huh. Wish you luck. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end of it, believe me. <laughs> That's it. You lost your patient. <laughs> so what I see, I mean by cooperation and environment, you have to take care of these little things. All right? Be aware of it. 
I had one case of insomnia I, I, I cured. I tell you what had happened. This woman in Montreal, she had terrible insomnia. And uh, by asking her question, taking case history, I discovered that it was subsequent to an operation that she had undergone, you know, right after the operation. So I suspect that there might be something there. So I, under this relaxed state, I suggested that you are going back to the time of the operation. So then what is, tell me what is going on and she told me. Then she was, uh, after the operation was over, she was just coming out of anesthesia and she was lying and uh, on the bed, you know, half doped up still, you know, still not completely out of this anesthesia. And she says, I am lying here, you know, and I am not fully awake, I have not come out. And I hear somewhere and two nurses are just passing by and one is telling the other, I hope she wakes up in the morning. <laughs> huh? To which subconscious mind interpreted as, literal interpreted, subconscious mind does not analyze that she might not wake up, she might be dead. So the defense is, it is better to be, you know, getting insomnia than to die. So the insomnia becomes a, becomes a defense against the greater danger which is death in her sub mind. Do you understand that? In couple other cases we found there is a Christian prayer when I lay myself to sleep. You, f you familiar with that prayer? Hmm? Do you remember it? There is one line in it. If I die before I wake, that prayer caused lots of insomnia in a dull case. <laughs> you know, if I die, oh my God, you know, if I die before I wake. So the, remember the defense, is a, the problem becomes a defense against this danger. So insomnia becomes a defense that if I don't sleep, no question of dying. You see how the, the things are done? All right. So in couple of cases such that prayer became the cause of the insomnia we had to find out and remove it. Now, so what I want you to be aware of is that environment and the personality of the hypnotist, that's the next factor. Now here you will be the hypnotist in your case, so you know your personality. Technique, you're going to learn the technique before the day is over. And that brings us to topic four, hypnosis, myths and reality. Hypnosis, myths and reality. Dr. Guinness, a practicing hypnotherapist in the States, said something very interesting. He said, we have been much too prone to lump hypnosis in the same category in which we file our ideas on witches, warlocks and wizards. Even orthodox science is inclined to approach the subject with very much the attitude of an average man investigating a haunted house. He doesn't believe in ghosts, but he definitely hopes he won't meet one. <laughs> he doesn't believe in ghosts, but he definitely hopes he won't meet one. Think about it. So, same attitude people have about hypnosis. Now, people believe there are certain myths about it. One being that hypnosis is an unnatural state. I told you that is false because uh, that's not true because simply you have been in and out of hypnosis several times in your life. Emotional states, waking up in the morning and brushing your teeth time, remember that? Then other religious services, you go to listen to a great religious speaker, you know, again you are a practical pur for practical purposes in a hypnotic state. Reading. You re must have happened to you reading a book, 20 pages later you don't remember a simple word, single word. Has it happened to you? Huh? You just, mo you know, you just going through the motion of turning the pages. Nothing is registered. Where were you? Or sometimes you are so engrossed into reading that you don't even know your mother came or your wife came or your father came and sitting there in that room. Hmm? That is again. Or daydreaming. How can you tell somebody is daydreaming? Huh? Glazed look, right. Blinking rate is reduced or stop. See, generally we blink about 25 times per minute. So the person has a glazed look and it tells us the person is somewhere else. Highway hypnosis, particularly in North America. You know, you're driving a car on the highway and uh, 
60 miles an hour, 65 miles an hour, you don't have to do anything, there's no oncoming traffic and monotonous sound of the engine, it's an automatic transmission and some people fall asleep at the wheel because of the monotony of it and they kill themselves. In India, we don't have this problem <laughs> because we keep on dodging stimuli while driving and there are enough people who will keep you awake <laughs> around you, you know. Supermarket hypnosis. In one of the experiments, whether in where you in North America, there are huge grocery stores, you know, and you go in there and there's a soft music, instrumental music in the background to soothe your nerves. And you pick up this cart and you walk into the rhythm without being aware of it. And you pick up this cart and you start walking. In one experiment, hidden cameras were registering the blinking rate of the buyers and it was brought down for 25 to 30 per minute to 5 to 10 per minute. So they go like this. They keep eggs in one end, on one end, and cheese at the other side. So between, in between the journey from eggs to cheese, they put all the things they don't need. And American homes generally need eggs and cheese. So they pick up things in between. All the high profit items are at the eye level. The ones they need are above the eye level or below the eye level. So they pick this one up, this one registers. They pick this one up, this one registers again. Eventually they pick that one up. All the candies and other stuff are at the cash register. And when the, some people collected so much stuff that they didn't even have the money to, didn't have the money to pay for it and their blinking rate started jumping as they approached the <laughs> cashier, you know, 60, 65 per minute. When I teach this course in North America, I give them three tips to save on grocery bills. One, go with full stomach. <laughs> See, when you're hungry, everything looks good. <laughs> even the items you hate, like spinach. <laughs> And uh, so you buy all the things you don't need when you are hungry because you are suggestible. Remember, hip, hungry is a, when you are hungry, it's an emotional state in a way. So it makes you highly suggestible. Then uh, that's one. Make a list of things you want to buy before you go and go to those places and not in between. And three, keep children at home. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she knows because she knows what it means. <laughs> So, that is supermarket hypnosis. Another misconception people have that this is dangerous. In train hand, there is no danger. See, danger comes from people who are either stupid or unscrupulous. Say uh, you read a book which says hypnosis gets rid of pain. Now, pain is a nature's way of telling you if something is wrong with you. So, if you have pain, you don't do self-hypnosis. You go to a doctor and find out what is wrong. So, some unsuspecting friend comes to you and says, I got abdominal pain. And you just uh, read a book about hypnosis. Oh, I'm going to get rid of it. So, the third day appendix burst. <laughs> you see? So, this is the, you know, it's dangerous than the person because hypnosis basically is a neutral thing. Third part, third misconception is, under hypnosis, the subject loses consciousness. It's absolutely untrue. You're fully aware throughout the state, throughout the time of the hypnosis. Under hypnosis, the subject will tell his innermost secrets. That is not true. You know, you can be even lie better sometimes if you are highly imaginative. <laughs> then hyp uh, hypnosis will, will weaken one's mind. That's not true. As a matter of fact, if you're a wish, weak, weak mind or wishy washy types, you wouldn't even make a good subject. You know. And then hypnosis is addictive. It isn't, which means if you don't do it after doing it for six years, if you stop it, it will not give you withdrawal symptoms. You, know? you might miss it because it's a pleasurable experience. You enjoy it. So that's one thing, but it will not have any bad side effects. Like if you were off heroin, then there will be withdrawal symptoms, which is what we mean by addiction. Then uh, the subject surrenders his will under hypnosis. As I pointed out, in hypnosis we are dealing with imagination, the person's or the subject's imagination. Lastly, subject will not awaken. That is another fear people have. What if I don't come out? See, you are not going anywhere. So, there is no question of coming out. You are fully aware throughout the time, so there is no question of not coming up. 
In reality, hypnosis is a normal psychophysiological phenomenon. Psychological because suggestion take effect depending on your conditioning. Physiological because your muscles are relaxed. Then uh, your electrical activity in your brain is not as much, you know, it is slowed down. Oxygen consumption is less. So, these are physiological manifestations of the state. Then uh, hypno and psychological means you take suggestion depending on your upbringing, depending on your background. Hypnosis above all is a pleasurable experience, you enjoy it. Even in the deepest trance, the subject is in contact with reality. Even the somnambulistic subject who are on the stage, they still know while they are doing it that they are on the stage performing. Hetero hypnosis, hetero meaning other in Greek. So, when I hypnotize you, it is called hetero hypnosis. If you do it yourself, it is known as self or auto hypnosis. So, hetero hypnosis is a close interpersonal relationship. It is like a doctor and a patient, there is an inbuilt trust. To be susceptible to hypnosis is not to be gullible or credulous because I pointed out all of us are suggestible. And in the final analysis, hypnosis is the means to heighten and direct susceptibility, which is an inherent characteristic of all human beings. All of us are suggestible, hypnosis heightens that suggestibility. So, through suggestion you go into hypnosis, suggestion given during hypnosis is even much more effective, which deepens the hypnosis, suggestions have a deeper effect or a better effect. So, it is a cycle like that, suggestion, hypnosis, suggestion, hypnosis.